Welcome to this 22nd of January edition of the Jane's World of Defence podcast, which for this edition is sponsored by Raphael Advanced Defence Systems. I'm Peter Felsted, the editor of Jane's Defence Weekly, and with me today I have the magazine's Middle East and Africa editor, Jeremy Binney, as well as our Europe editor, Nick Ferenza. But in fact, it'll mostly be the Jeremy Binney show, as we're going to be talking about the assassination of Iranian military leader Qasem Soleimani and its repercussions. Then we'll talk a little about President Trump's wishes for greater NATO involvement in the Middle East, and then we'll have some coverage from the International Armoured Vehicles show this week in London. So, to the main story, and just to recap, on the 27th of December last year, a rocket attack killed a US civilian contractor at the K-1 base near Kirkuk in Iraq. The US government blamed this and several previous attacks on the pro-Iranian Kataib Hezbollah militant group and carried out airstrikes against three of the group's locations in Iraq and two in Syria on the 29th of December. Kataib Hezbollah members and supporters then responded by attempting to enter the US embassy in Baghdad on 31st of December. Having apparently allowed the protesters to reach the embassy in Baghdad's green zone, Iraqi security forces subsequently deployed in significant numbers and the situation was ultimately contained, but certainly on the US side, not without thoughts of perhaps a a second Benghazi happening. Then, on the 2nd of January, President Donald Trump ordered the targeted assassination of Major General Qasem Soleimani, who's leader of the Islamic Revolution Guards Corps' Quds Force, as he was travelling in convoy next to Baghdad airport. That strike conducted by a US Reaper-armed UAV, also killed six other people, among whom was Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, leader of the pro-Iranian Kataib Hezbollah militant group. Now, the Iranian response came early on the 7th of January, when more than a dozen missiles were launched at two US bases in Iraq, Ain al-Assad Air Base in Al-Ambar province, and a base near the northern city of Arbil. Apparently, while some US personnel suffered concussions as a result of these attacks, there were no serious casualties, Washington thus opted not to retaliate, and there was consequently a de-escalation of the overall situation, though not without a tragedy in the meanwhile, when on the 8th of January, an IRGC air defence unit mistakenly shot down Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752, with two SAMs fired from a Tor M1 system, killing all 176 on board. So, Jeremy, what what do you make of all this? Firstly, why did Trump, apparently spurred by US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who's an Iran hawk, decide to take out Soleimani? Because he's doubtless been in the US crosshairs several times before now. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, I think the uh, events of January are certainly very interesting. Maybe... They won't be studied in the same detail by international affairs students like the Cuban Missile Crisis, but uh, uh, certainly a case study in um, managing escalation. So why did the Trump administration decide to kill Soleimani? Um, So essentially, we go back to the rocket attack on the 27th of December. This isn't unusual. Rocket attacks happen all the time against uh, US bases uh, or operating locations in Iraq. The difference here is that uh, a US national actually gets killed, a contractor. So to re-establish deterrence, then we have the airstrikes and things begin to escalate. But really, the targeting of Soleimani is is really way above what the the Iranians have done at this stage in terms of um, in terms of a sort of a balanced tit for tat exchange. So this is one of their main guys. Uh, He has been running allied uh, militant groups across the Arab world, whether that's the Houthis, Hezbollah, Qatib Hezbollah in in Iraq. He's been propping up Assad. He's a key player. He has established quite a lot of status in the region, especially since 2014, because he's appeared on the front lines uh, in Iraq, fighting the Islamic State uh, on multiple occasions with Kurdish groups, Shia groups, even Sunni groups sometimes. So uh, he has this he has this standing, this state Status, this gravitas that uh, makes him a very important person for the Iranians, uh, symbolically, uh, if not 
militarily and uh, and strategically for them. So they have to do something here. This is uh, this is really really embarrassing for them. So did the Trump administration realize that when they took him out? Did they understand that they were really driving the situation potentially to the brink of war here? And what about the fact that he was taken out in Baghdad in the company? of his proxies in, in, in the country. Yeah. yeah, because obviously that that's almost like, well, from the one hand, it's been put that the Americans felt that he was actually just being too high-handed in how he could simply just walk about in their Iraqi backyard. Well, I, it does seem he was moving around relatively freely. I, I'm sure he was taking security arrangements. But uh, so the, the, the Americans were, were tracking him. And so he, and we now know he moved from Lebanon, where he met Hezbollah leader Nasrallah, back to Damascus, where he got on the flight and flew to Baghdad, met Abu Mahdi al Mohandis. So I think there's um, there were questions. Okay, so if you didn't want to escalate the situation quite so much, maybe you pick him off in Syria maybe at Damascus International Airport rather than Baghdad, and you don't necessarily have to claim responsibility for that. So there's a bit of ambiguity whether you did it or the Israelis did it, and then you can but kind of move But that would really on. drop the Israelis in it, wouldn't it? Well, well, well potentially. There would, still be, there would still be fallout from that. But uh, from the American military perspective, I think it's a lot easier for them to actually operate over Baghdad than it would be Damascus because they're, dealing, they're not dealing with a hostile air defence network, for starters. So they can have the UAVs up there loitering. So supposedly uh, Soleimani's flight was was a bit delayed from Damascus anyway. So that might have been a problem. But having that sort of persistent surveillance over the target, uh, and there's no doubt these guys are both very hostile to uh, US and coalition interests in the region. But it's really so. Why now? Has he been in the in the sites before? We're kind of told he has been. But perhaps the previous national security team around Trump has restrained him. So apparently Trump did know who Suleimani was. This isn't just some obscure figure that someone brings to him to kill. He surely would day. have been briefed on him at some point. Yeah, so apparently he's been discussing hitting Suleimani since May 2017 when the Houthis in Yemen launched a ballistic missile attack on Riyadh just as uh, President Trump was about to arrive. So he was aware of this guy but has previously been restrained by a more cautious national security team where you've got Mattis as uh, Secretary of Defence and Dunford as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So now he seems to have more of a team who are prepared to actually take this kind of action. How much they discussed the escalation pathways that could come out of this and the, and the potential implications, that's what we don't really know at this stage, Pete. Well, also, I mean, we've got, we've got a situation there where, I mean, I... My view is that he's really got away with one there because I just don't think they game this out properly. If they were looking at the consequences and how bad that was going to be and how things finally ended out, they must have thought, well, that worked out rather well because had the Iranian response actually killed US service personnel, the Americans would have had to have responded themselves. And we, we know from what the Iranians said that they had hundreds of missiles that they could potentially have fired and the whole thing would have flared up. Well, I, I think that, you know, that is that it was a, a genuine risk, Pete. So when we look at the actual ballistic missile strike, so satellite imagery emerged afterwards of the base, uh, not something that James would publish, but, uh, but it's out there. It showed that the Iranians essentially targeted the aircraft operations area at Al-Assad Air Base in um, Al Anbar province. So given the situation where, so we're told there were early warnings, a lot of people knew about the impending attack, how detailed those were, we don't know. But what we do know is that the Americans would have been very alert to a potential attack. Their satellites could probably pick up the ballistic missile launches. Uh, using the um, infrared signatures, the radars could then track them coming in. This is going to give personnel at bases a few minutes to actually get into the shelters. So the Iranians would probably expect by using ballistic missiles, they are fundamentally giving a bit of early warning and that the Americans are going to move away from certain areas in the base and move into shelters to take cover. They know these bases pretty well. As I say, they rocket attack them fairly frequently. 
but the accuracy of the ballistic missiles that they're using is a bit spotty. I mean, we're, it, it's pretty impressive because some of them are essentially scud derivatives that have gone through all sorts of changes and now... And it's are, a mixture, wasn't it? So we think it's a mixture of the uh, key and the new Kiam, uh, which is... Uh, he has now now got a, a guided re-entry vehicle and probably the FATA 313, uh, which is a member of the um, FATA uh, uh, 110 solid propellant tactical ballistic missile family. And in, in terms of expected accuracy, CEPs mm-hmm. or whatever, what 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 is your thought on Yeah, it's, that? it's still difficult to give a bit of a C- CEP. We've seen a number of attacks using the combination of these types of weapons that the Iranians have launched from Western Iran against uh, either the Islamic State in Syria or Iranian Kurdish rebel bases in northern Iraq. And some of them look pretty good, others don't look good at all. They always have some failures. But with this level of reliability, they can't really guarantee that all their missiles are actually going to fall on the aircraft operations area of Ain al-Assad base which is going to be probably evacuated at the time. And actually, we saw that in the satellite imagery. So they got a wild one off on a taxiway. There's another even wilder one down in the um, old uh, hardened aircraft shelters that the Saddam military built. So it was very possible that you have a scenario where one of these ballistic missiles lands smack on a shelter where a bunch of Americans are sheltering, killing them all, because this is these shelters are designed to resist mortars and rockets. And, and fragments. And fragments, essentially, yeah. say so, so where, the, where we would have multiple casualties, at which point, given what Trump has previously said, he pretty much has to then respond in some sort of kind, at which point we are again in this escalation situation. Yeah. So I, I think it was, well, I think everybody was relatively lucky, apart from, of course, with the shoot down. Now, this is, this is, of course, a tragedy. It's not the first time it's happened. The Russians have done it. The Americans have done it, inadvertently taking out a civilian airliner when they think there's some kind of other threat up there. So what's going on there? What does that tell us about Iran's air defences and about their command and control? Because we're talking about an air defence unit which is down the road from an international airport. It's not as if they haven't had airliners flying past them probably all evening. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it does seem inconceivable uh, that they would shoot down an airliner, given the situation. Now, the context of this is this is just a few hours after the ballistic missile strike. So the Iranians are expecting a counterattack. They probably don't even know at this stage that they have failed to kill any Americans. So they are expecting an imminent counterattack from the Americans. So these guys are going to be on uh, extremely high alert. Brigadier General Amir Hajizada, the commander of the IRGC Aerospace Force, which is responsible for both the ballistic missiles and their air defences, which are actually separate from the main Iranian Air Defence Force, which I think might be an important point. He has given an explanation for why the airliner was shot down. So he he noted, obviously, the highly incredibly tense situation. He said the uh, air defence network was actually detecting incoming cruise missiles, presumably falsely. Uh, so they thought they were already under attack. The net, everyone around the network was being warned. For some reason, he did not explain that even though they were on the highest level of alert, thought they were under attack, the military failed to ground civilian aircraft coming out of Tehran. Why? We don't know. I mean, this is a, this is a seemingly a major blunder given the situation. Secondly, the communication network was having problems so when the commander of what we now is confirmed as a tor m1 short-range air defense system picks up what he thinks is a cruise missile he apparently cannot contact his uh superior officer to ask permission to fire and has to make the uh decision independently or so uh hajizada says what we kind of know though from the irgc is they are encouraged to uh uh, fairly aggressive to take fairly aggressive action. So we don't really know how that command and control network works. It wasn't working effectively on that night. The civilian aircraft had not been cleared. So this is a highly dangerous situation. We've got nervous air defenders. Um, this guy would have known that there were airliners in the area when he pushed the button. And surely but- if he's looking at the track... If he's, if he's looking at the track and he's trying to call somebody, the track's moving so he can see where it's going. 
is it really going to be the kind of track you'd expect from an incoming well, cruise missile? Well, I'm, 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 I'm not an air defender, Pete, and familiar with exactly what sort of uh, reading you would get on a Tor M1, but I'm presuming the search radar would show you that this is a fairly large object that is climbing and doesn't show you uh, what you would expect from a cruise missile. Mm. But I think there's another fact, some other factors we have to uh, factor in here. Now, there's a video seemingly showing the missiles being launched and then hitting the aircraft. They actually are fired in sequence, so fairly soon after each other, rather than simultaneously, as you might expect if you were doing your utmost to rip apart a cruise missile before it hit you. So one thing there if they were essentially ad adopted a procedure where they fire one, reassess the target, and then fire a second, if it hasn't, if the target has not been destroyed, then to get an effective second shot in, they have to essentially open up at the system's maximum range of 12 kilometers. And that is the range that Hajizada gave. And that is the range that essentially fits with where the first impact happened over Parand and where the uh, Bidkana ballistic missile base is located, which the tour was probably defending. Right. So the whole procedure thing is probably also forcing the, the commander of the tour to make a snap decision. He has to fire at maximum range to get a second or possibly a third shot in because they're firing in sequence rather than simultaneously where you would get a, more, uh, a higher chance of destroying the target at the first go. Right. Okay, well, that's fascinating stuff. Now, in wake of that, I'm now going to uh, talk to Nick, who has something to discuss with regard to Trump's calls for NATO involvement in the Middle East. But first, here's a message from the sponsor of this episode. This podcast is sponsored by Rafael Advanced Defence Systems, ensuring land superiority with the following systems. Trophy, the world's only operational active protective system for any armoured fighting vehicle. Spike, the fifth generation anti-tank guided missile. Samson, the family of remote control weapon stations, as well as other generators of combat advantage for armed forces, as seen at the IAV 2020 trade show. Uh, and now I'm going to talk to Nick a bit about what Trump wants out of NATO with regard to the Middle East. Now, where are we there, Nick? Well, Trump, after um, these events, was um, basically pushing for uh, the Europeans to get more involved in the Middle East. And uh, he was suggesting the creation of NATO me, NATO Middle East. It's not quite clear what this means, but there, there are certain things that, that really must be kept in mind. Uh, I think at NATO and Brussels, they're also trying to figure out uh, what exactly he means. Our correspondent there uh, can't get any answers out of people because I don't think there are any answers. But I think... Well, presumably Trump didn't even consult with anyone before he said that oh, yeah. anyway. Well, of course not. <laughs> but in any case, the idea is... Is again this burden-sharing argument? Europeans have to do more. Their oil is coming from uh, from the Middle East. The U.S. is um, independent energy-wise. Um, but it's not as if the French, for example, aren't quite heavily engaged in places like Mali. Yes, I think this is something which uh, which is forgotten, especially uh, in the states where countering terrorism is, is seen as the U.S. Uh, doing it single-handedly. But this idea of a NATO me. There are several questions that have to be um, asked about it. I mean, does it just mean more European involvement as NATO members in the Middle East? Does it mean some kind of alliance uh, between NATO and uh, Middle Eastern uh, countries? In any case, the, the, the whole idea is to, to lighten the burden on, um, on the states, and I'm not sure that 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 can be assumed. I mean, the U.S. is still going to uh, need to be um, involved. The Europeans don't have the capabilities. If we're talking about some kind of alliance arrangement, I mean, NATO is a collective uh, defense organization. So, I mean, if the U.S. is a member of NATO or a member of NATO in the Middle East, it still would have treaty um, obligations to uh, come to the defense of, of its allies. Also, what seems not to be realized is that European countries are quite heavily involved in the Middle East, maybe not in the NATO context, but there are even countries which um, are reluctant to uh, get involved in uh, military in interventions like uh, like Germany. Okay, Germany is not actually firing weapons, but it is um, has um, a major role in uh, in training um, Kurds and 
Also, there are flying uh, reconnaissance uh, missions um, with tornado uh, aircraft from Jordan. But you have other European countries like the UK uh, and France doing special forces operations and airstrikes. And I mean, the Germans are not the only continental European country which are doing uh, training efforts. I mean, almost every uh, NATO member seems to already have trainers on the ground. Now, NATO is actually providing training also, but at the higher level, they're training like staff officers in a uh, center in um And of course, that's Baghdad. really the best model, isn't it? In actually training the country's armed forces to do the job themselves, rather than putting your boots on the ground, or in this case, Europe's boots on the ground. This uh, makes sense from the European uh, uh, perspective, but uh, I mean, it's not as if the Europeans don't have boots on the ground anyway. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Okay, let's now turn to Samuel Cranley Evans, editor of Jane's Armoured Fighting Vehicles, whose recent return from London's International Armoured Vehicles trade show. For this next section of the Jane's World of Defence podcast, we're going to be talking to John Strydham, who heads up the Land Division of Newton Defence in the UK. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the main themes at IAV, the International Armed Vehicles Conference, just concluding in Twickenham in London. John, thank you for joining us. Could you explain a little bit about uh, what Newton does as a company and your role within that? Absolutely. So, as you as you'll know, Sam, my background is I was a I was a, I was an army officer for about ten years, and, and since then I've joined Newton. And Newton is a a company that that really solves problems. We we work with clients across defence, both uh, both on the industry side and within government agencies, solving some of the biggest challenges defence faces today. Uh, we do that by working with alongside our clients, understanding you know the real problems and the real challenges they're facing using data and science to be able to quantify those and then working with them to you know, build solutions to those problems. So typically we work in uh, equipment procurement or maintenance programs. We work uh, in, in sort of systems, in, uh, you know, personnel side, data, um, and as well as sort of driving big change through organisations and supporting our clients to do that. Excellent. John, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Great, great to be on the show, Sam. Let's jump straight into it, John. The first thing that came up was several panellists in, in a lot of the conferences were talking about the importance of the man in the machine, the infantry soldier who is operating the armoured vehicle on the ground. I have a few thoughts on this because I myself, I'm technically focused. I think that the, the machines are important and the capabilities that the machines bring are important. I was wondering if we could get your perspective on that from your, uh, your personal experience as a, a tank commander in the British Army and your professional experience as well within Newton. Yeah, absolutely. So I, th I think, you know, from my, my military experience, I, I would say it, it's important. We're all taught at a very, very young age as, as soldiers that, you know, it is the person who's operating the equipment that is the, the important, you know, the battle winning capability, if you like. I, I think my experience since I've left the army is, you know, actually that, that capability can only be brought to bear when you bring the equipment and you bring a well-trained person together and therefore you know I think they're really equally important you need you know world-class equipment which is maintained which is able to do its job but you need the people who are operating it the people who are maintaining it and the people who are supplying it all to be you know well-trained and able feeling able to, to to bring their part as well yeah that makes a lot of sense having the, the confidence that the equipment you've got is the right stuff for the job right that makes that's just logical. We're all we're all happier when that's the case. Do you think that there is a need to have world class equipment? Because there there is tend to be this sort of myopic focus sometimes on having the very best vehicle that can possibly be procured. Perhaps we should be, or defence procurement agencies in general should be looking to provide their soldiers with the best possible vehicle that's available at that time. Yeah, I, I think I think you know there, there's often the the trade off between having the perfect solution tomorrow and having a a good enough solution today um, and I, th I think you know being able to really look at that that case and uh, being able to value those measure those understand you know what you're getting tomorrow and whether it's worth the you know whether it's worth waiting waiting till then is, is really important you know so I, I, th I think the importance of of taking a sort of an objective view that all of us want to you know want to be able to talk about and want to be able to uh, you know in my, in my former life I would have loved to have you know been in, in the most advanced vehicles, the most advanced equipment in the world, but you know it's about it's about that balance, isn't it? And it's about being able to, to quantify and measure and just you know sort of really distill down what is important. 
Yeah, I, I did some reading recently on a, a Russian chap whose name escapes me, but he had actually figured out an equation that allowed you to deduce how effective a main battle tank was based on its cost and things like that, which is quite interesting. Um, I don't know how, you know, it's a purely academic exercise. I don't know if it would really help any procurement decisions, but it, it, it's definitely something to talk about is it is how we assess the efficacy of a vehicle and a formation you know do we should we be looking at a vehicle purely in terms of its protection mobility and firepower or should we look at it more as a complete system which is, is another uh, theme that came up at the talks actually I, i'd be really interested you know I, th- I think you know as well as anyone and i'm sure i'm sure your listeners will know that you know any vehicle is about is about balance it's about trading off survivability i you know the, the armor the armor the protection uh, mobility its ability to move across country and on roads both strategic and operational with its lethality its ability to project force and project an effect and you're trading off all of those things so you can have something which has very high lethality and is quite quick and quite maneuverable but you sacrifice survivability and, and any system you know and i think i think system is a great word you use is about understanding your limiting factors and I think it's really recognizing that the weakest of any of those things is the thing that's going to constrain the effectiveness of that that platform or that capability. You know, if you've got great great mobility and great survivability, but you haven't got an armament that can deliver an effect, you know, that becomes your, your limiting factor. And that sort of methodology and that sort of thinking is at the heart of what I do with Newton now, which is looking at systems in defense and, and processes and, and, you know, that, 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 that integration of systems equipment people and working out you know what are the limiting factors do you think in that sense then that it's important to have a clear idea of what the platform or or the system is expected to do i think so yes i I think you need to be able to have a clear idea and a a clear idea is you know what i mean by that is you need to be able to measure it in in a meaningful practical way in a way that's useful you know measuring a you know the caliber of a main armor it tells you something measuring its range measuring its rate of fire measuring its ability to penetrate armor tells you a completely different thing so you know i think it's about understanding what is important and, and you know what gives you a good way to describe or measure what that capability or that that factor is giving you yeah i think that makes sense i think i wonder then if you could talk me down the path a little bit uh going back to the man in the machine so quite often we hear this discussion about the modern generation, which I guess is kind of my generation and maybe the one that's coming after me and their, their focus on the, the digital world and their their ability to use iPhones. Do you think that this, this modern generation could perhaps bring an in- increased capability that wasn't available to previous generations, the analog generation and things like that? I, th- I think so. It's difficult to... Uh, I think it's based only on my experience of you know, having served with, with people of different ages and with different backgrounds and, and you know, some of the people I work with today. But I, I think there are definite, you know, I've seen generational differences in how people react to technology. And I think in thinking about a capability and thinking about how you integrate the, the person with the, the, the equipment and with the machine, it's about understanding you know, the breadth of knowledge, the breadth of background, the age differences. You know, what are the factors that determine how well those things come together? Um, you know, people of different ages think in different ways. I think, I think that's true. People of different backgrounds think in different ways. And, and it's understanding you know, really how broad that audience is and therefore being able to cater, you know, cater to that audience. So a, a much lauded example was back in the 90s when you know, Challenger came out and it had the, the sort of PlayStation style uh, gunner's controls and commander's controls as a good example of something, an early attempt to try and integrate that. And, and you can see that sort of progression of you know, sort of comfort with digital displays, comfort with you know, multiple sources of information, which I think are much more uh, common commonplace in you know in today's sort of people you know today's operators of equipment one of the presentations that was really interesting was from the uh, israeli defense force on the carmel program uh, the ex- the experiment that they've got going on and a requirement for that is that two personnel should be able to operate an armored vehicle using only the mission systems so the cameras and and the sensors that the vehicle carries and they've got th- three bids in for that competition um one of them uses uh, i think two of them use joystick type controls uh, but one of them 
is controlled entirely using an, an actual Xbox 360 controller. And of all three, they all they all performed very well in the experiment, but it was the one with the Xbox 360 controller where the, the, the test group reported that it was the easiest to use, um, you know, and, and they were most at home with it. And, and I think... The, the people using it, they had just left the Israeli Defense Force. So they, you know, they, they're kind of my generation. Um, so that, that was a really interesting insight into perhaps, you know, where future warfare is going. I, th- I think it is really interesting. And it's a, it's a really exciting future. And you, you can see the applications of that technology and, you know, the ability to gain battlefield situational awareness and, and so on. I, I think that's really positive. But all of that is as naught if you if you can't get that armoured vehicle to where it needs to be to exert the effect. You know, working, well-maintained, the crew fully trained. And if you can bring all those things together, I think then, you know, that extra 5% that having a, a state-of-the-art system becomes really, really important. I think and that those sort of factors are something it's very easy to lose sight of when we're comparing you know two different systems on a you know on a, on a trade show floor for example yeah it's the the totality of the battlefield isn't it is what matters ultimately exactly um and that actually links us into a next theme uh which is one of the representatives at the conference said armies have to be ready now and respond tomorrow with what is already available and he was referring to uh you know the state of equipment in in nato basically and the the threat which was was unspoken is russia because there there are a lot of forward looking solutions but the issues that were raised by i think one of the us representatives at the conference was that um once upon a time every bridge in europe was built with uh, a compartment in it that explosives could be placed in to destroy the bridge uh, which I didn't actually know. And he also said that we used to know the weight and width of every single bridge in, in Europe. By that, I mean the, the weight that it could carry. And these things are now unknown or not readily available, at least. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how, uh, you know, in your experience at Newton, you how you kind of look at readiness and, and how you would consider working with an armed force to improve readiness or, or assess readiness? I, th- I think it's a really good point. I think typically, you know, following on from the, the, the conversations we've had, you know, our enemies don't fight in the way that we want them to fight and we can't plan how, you know, it's in their interest to try and hit us at our weakest and therefore you know, exposing those gaps in our knowledge and capability and, you know, our, our thinking about the modern battlefield, that, that's naturally the case. I, I'm struck by your example of the bridges. Um, so one of the things that, you know, building on the, the previous conversation we've had around, you know, technology is only good if you can bring it to the battlefield is exactly that idea of readiness as you describe it. Uh, and readiness is, you know, is usually defined as can you bring you know, a whole force with all of the constituent parts, the equipment you need, uh, the personnel you need, fully trained, etc., together to achieve an effect. But uh, one of the factors, of course, is even when you brought them together, usually the enemy is not going to strike you where you've assembled your force. They're going to strike you where you're weak. And that goes back to the art of war, doesn't it? And therefore, your ability to then move that force and get it to where you need to is a key component of, of you know, being able to bring effect to bear. And I, and I think... It, it, it's that sort of understanding of all of those factors and then once you can assemble the force with all of the, all the constituent parts how quickly can you get it to somewhere to exert an effect and having that sort of level of understanding tells you not just where are you weak in time or where in your sort of force generation cycles or uh, you know history is full of stories of, of opposing forces striking when people are on holiday or the weather is bad or you know when we're not at our strongest and I think understanding those sort of natural patterns is part of being able to really evaluate your readiness and, and, and you know, and, and mitigate and you know, sort of protect yourself from those vulnerabilities, and then understanding geographically, you know, where you can apply that effect most easily and where it's difficult for you, and therefore where you're vulnerable. Yeah, that makes sense, and it it stands up to logical reasoning as well, right? So, I guess an important thing then, perhaps for analysts and and industry, would be to look at the existing equipment stocks of a country. Obviously, there has to be a focus on replacing or or improving those equipment stocks over time, but maybe looking at how 
what exists can be improved or the way in which it is moved could be improved or, or, or something like that. I, th- I think that's right. And I, I think you know, our, our attention is always drawn towards the exciting, large capabilities, the things that are expensive and, you know, the sort of impressive so armored vehicles or you know a new armament system or clever sensors that are at the cutting edge of technology but actually if you know the the system that provides your drinking water is missing a filter and you can't get you know potable drinking water in the field that becomes the constraint the limiting factor on your ability to achieve your mission and that that sort of goes back to that principle we talked about earlier that you need to consider everything and what is the what is the weakest point in it in an ecosystem or a system not just what is the strongest point and how can you move that further and and taking that sort of balanced view between how do you extend your strongest capabilities but bring bring your weaker capabilities up and actually have a conversation around your weaker capabilities i think is really important and you know that's something we've taken forward in in, in newton and we do with that with our clients is is trying to understand both you know what their real strengths are and building on those but also where their vulnerabilities are yeah i think it it would do a lot of analysts and industry uh, a lot of good i think to talk about potential weaknesses in designs uh, um not necessarily openly because obviously there are there are limits on how much somebody can talk about armor and things like that but there was a reticence i would say to talk about uh, you know the potential realities of modern warfare at the conference, and I, I've noticed it a little bit wider as well. You know, the the reality is, uh, according to Dr. Lester Grau and, and Chuck Bartles, who who are over in the US and do a lot of writing on Russia, Russia is still an artillery army, and uh, we can see from a a presentation given by a Ukrainian officer actually at IAV, I think eighty seven percent of Ukraine's losses. Uh, in in the war in Donbass were caused by artillery. So I think there is a focus on IEDs and and anti tank guided missiles, but you know together those threats only accounted for thirteen percent of all of their armored vehicle losses. So we focus on these things, and I think in the West certainly we're very very good at countering IEDs, countering anti tank guided missiles, and you know this can be seen the, the the Trophy Active Protection System and the the Iron Fist Active Protection System from Elbert are both. You know, they've got good records in testing or, or, or in actual field use. Um, and, and obviously, the capabilities that we have with MRAP vehicles to survive mine blasts is, is vastly superior to really anything else that is available. But if you talk to people about artillery, it tends to get a little bit awkward because that's not necessarily something that you can protect an armoured vehicle from. It's certainly difficult. And I, and I think it goes back to... You know, if, if you consider vulnerabilities or you consider losses, uh, it, there is a there is a sort of temptation in our psyche to consider, you know, the the high profile, the prominent, the novel, the new, the the unexplained, um, or, or or the large. You know, if an if a single event you know causes a, a loss of life on a large scale, you know that becomes very totemic. It becomes easy to you know, sort of attach news articles to, etc. And obviously, it, it, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a great, you know, it's a tragedy. But something which happens every day, which causes one or two casualties, you know, by contrast, can tend to go unreported. But when you add it up over time, you know, that can have a similar effect. And, and the artillery is, a good, I think, a good example of that sort of effect, of something which, you know, forget the pun, forgive the pun, but passes under the radar. Um, you know, but, but when you add it up, you know, does does become quite significant, a, a significant cause of attrition or of loss. We see that a lot in the business world as well, where everybody knows about the disasters where, you know, something crashes or something doesn't work and you spend a lot of money and it, and it doesn't doesn't go as planned. And everyone's attention is drawn to that. But the, the sort of slow drip of the tap, the, the you know, the, the five pounds here, 10 pounds there, you know, adds up very, very quickly and can become a comparable, if not greater, you know, source of loss, you know, that you don't see. I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. I don't wonder if you could touch on one more subject. So one of the um, representatives at the conference remarked that to use an assembly or form up area before you move on to a contact is no longer tenable. He said that that is no longer an option, which actually 
prompted somebody from the panel to say that they disagreed, but there wasn't really any further discussion on it. Is that something that you could talk to us a little bit about? What are your feelings on that? You know, from from what you've experienced from the defense industry and from your own personal experience as well. I think it's a really good point. So one of the things when you're a and you're a fairly new tank commander that you're taught to do is how to organize yourself before you assault an objective. So, you know, you, you bring, the, bring the tanks in, you bring the infantry fighting vehicles in, you know, you usually do it in dead ground, out of, out of sight. Uh, and the sort of the marker, the thing you want to measure really is how, how little time you're spending there. Because while you're all milling around, getting yourself sorted out, working out who's going left and who's going right, you're inherently vulnerable. And therefore measuring, you know, that sort of it comes back to that idea of concentration and dispersal, doesn't it? That, that we know from our, from our doctrine and from, from military strategy books. And the less time you're concentrated as a force until you come together on the objective, the better, because you're vulnerable to artillery, you're, you're vulnerable to um, you know air interdiction or any any of those things. So generally, I, I think it, it's always something. I think you feel a bit vulnerable. You you you're sort of trained to you know feel a bit vulnerable about you know being together and. You know, sort of milling around, getting yourself sorted, and therefore the ability to get a position, you know, organise yourself, and and you know, sort of move quickly. I think is a, is a good marker of a well trained force or well drilled force. So you know, I, th- I think extend that logic. Would it be better if we didn't have to do that, and you could, you know, through systems or you know, through a telepathic understanding, converge on an objective without needing to do that? Well, yes, obviously, but the the potential for that to go wrong um, is, is is quite high, and that, and that could be worse. Yeah, I mean, I can't really see what the solution is because the the implication would be that you would have to gradually assemble and amass force on the march, which presents its own problems. It does. It does, but but I think the the theory is the theory is interesting and certainly worth you know for military strategists out there to test and trial and see see if it works or not. Yeah, so definitely something to unpack, isn't it? And I think actually that that could link into one of the other things that uh, one of the panels was discussing is this um, <clears throat> this need to have all of the training simulators in NATO. Uh, become interoperable because at the moment the training simulators for a Challenger 2 cannot operate in the same environment as a training simulator for a Leopard 2. And so there's this inability for NATO to practice large-scale operators operations in a, a simulation environment. And it, 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 we all know that simulations have their limits, but they also have their strengths. You know, the uh, one of the representatives talk about a, a brigade versus brigade exercise that they did through simulators, but they had to engage with the industry extensively because it required 6,000 simulators for this exercise um, and it lasted 10 days. But you can see the value in having a brigade versus brigade exercise uh, because you can establish you know, how well units work together and things like that. So I think that could li- link into that previous point about the you know, can we or can we not have assembly areas? A training environment, a simulated training environment would provide a safe space to practice that. It, it certainly would. You know, I'm, not, I'm a big fan of simulators. I think simulators are brilliant at, you know, sort of testing, collaboration, interoperability, your ability, you know, you can make mistakes and fail frequently, which I think is a, is a great principle generally. They're obviously less useful for you know, battle inoculation, getting people used to the smell, the sounds of, you know, of, of engaging in a firefight or any of those sort of things. But but they have you know a very broad range of uses, and I think you know the ability to reset without needing to drive back to where you started and, and go again accelerates the speed at which you can learn and, and you can sort of build build confidence and capability. So I, I'm all for simulators. I, I think they they can add a lot of value in that context. The challenges of you know using them effectively is of course about being really clear what it is you want to achieve in the first place. Yeah, I mean, uh, General Dynamics actually gave a presentation on the Ajax program, and they were saying that traditionally a training breakdown is twenty percent simulators and eighty percent would be done on the vehicles. And as a company, 
General Dynamics is looking to try and reverse that trend. And it has developed some very high fidelity six plane of motion simulators for Ajax. And they showed footage of it actually moving over a known path at Bovington, which I suspect you would be familiar with as well. Um, and it you know, you you could see that it was it was actually quite representative of what the vehicle actually does when you see it on its trials footage. So it's, you know, I think perhaps there there is room for much greater use of simulators within within armed force training and doctrine, and perhaps to try out some newer methodologies, some new tactics to get the most. Again, coming back to this these old Cold War vehicle fleets that, that everybody in NATO has and, and, and new ways to get the most out of them before the next generation comes in. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think if you compare simulator technology to maybe 10, 15 years ago, they're obviously leaps and bounds more advanced and more sophisticated. So what you can train and what you can achieve with them has grown as well, you know, in line with that, which is, I think, really exciting. But I think it's, it's about balancing that against the cost and you know, being really clear sighted about what it is you want to achieve and then saying, well, what is the best option? Is it, do I need a state of the art simulator? Is that the right thing, the cheapest, the best option to achieve what I want to achieve? Or actually, could I achieve it by you know, sitting in my armored vehicle with the power turned off and getting people comfortable with where the buttons are? And it really depends on what you want to achieve, what the right what the right model is, doesn't it? Yeah. So we keep coming back to this this theme of you you need to know what the end result is. I think so, and I think you know, one of the principles of war they teach you in the British Army the the first principle is that selecting and maintaining your aim, being clear what it is you want to achieve, is the most important thing to start with. And I think that's that's as true today as it was fifty years ago or a hundred years ago. Yeah. Definitely. I think we'll, we'll pivot just for the, the last few minutes. So uh, this podcast is sponsored by Raphael, but this isn't connected to that. Uh, Raphael have a technology called Fireweaver, which is a, a fire control system. You can link multiple augmenters, uh, which the company defines as, you know, uh, sighting systems, UAVs, main battle tanks and effectors, which, again, would be the main battle tanks, missile systems, infantry, things like that into a, an, a system which automates target selection and target designation to the units. There is a man in the loop, obviously, but I was wondering if you could take us down the path of you know, what you see within the industry in terms of attitudes towards this type of system, because this is you know, all that the personnel using the system really have to do is decide whether or not they want to engage that target. They're, they're not involved if they don't want to be in the processes leading up to that. I think it's really exciting and if I, if I sort of go back to when I, when I was doing my, my armoured vehicle training and, and learning how to you know, be a gunner in a, in a tank and one of the things that strikes you is until you get you know, good at the, the sort of the, um, the fine motor skills of being able to acquire a target, track a target and engage a target, in many cases you know, your body is trying to catch up with your brain and you can see what it is you want to do and you know, your ability to do it is then is limited by your own skills, by your own ability to do that. Add in all the distractions of fatigue, of you know, difficult atmospheric conditions, of multiple sources of information. Frequently, you can see how the person becomes the, the limiting factor. Now, of course, you know, there are legal and ethical implications to that which you know, will have to be taken into account. But I think... It goes back to you know that idea of you know, what is the what is the bottleneck in the system and in engaging and acquiring multiple targets. Frequently, it's not that the sensors aren't picking up individuals; it's that the human can't interact with it. And therefore, anything which makes that easier for the human to do their job, I think, can only be a good thing. Yeah, and I think also there's there is an element of human error to consider, isn't there? I was researching a little while ago a Canadian initiative to automate its combat air target designation on the ground because there was one unfortunate incident in Afghanistan where a ten figure grid reference had either been read out wrong by a, a tired special force operatives on the ground or misheard by you know a, a, a tired pilot and it, it led to a, a blue force engagement so you know if we can take that avenue for a mistake out of the entire fire control process that that could actually facilitate and improve the effects that are achieved on a battlefield it, it could um, you know in my, my current 
current job, one of the things we spend a lot of time looking at is, is data sets. And frequently what you see is you have data sets that are system generated and you have data sets that are human generated. And the quality, the consistency of system generated data is almost always better. Um, because people have different opinions. They like different fonts. They like some use capital letters, some use small letters. Machines don't have those problems. Uh, and therefore, you know, the, the possibility for misunderstanding or the possibility for errors creeps in really easily. So I, I would agree. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I think it's a it's a super interesting topic. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this particular element develops, not just the Fireweaver system from Raphael, but also, you know, other sim- similar systems. We know Russia has what would appear to be a relatively mature system, which is part of its Ratnik uh, combat soldier system. And and reportedly, according to some Russian media outlets, you know, some of the artillery and air engagements in Syria were actually monitored and approved from Moscow, which if it's true, you know, it's a very long screwdriver for one, but also it shows, you know, the, the fidelity of these systems and the capability to delegate control so far away from the battlefield, which makes the command and control system more survivable in theory. It it does, and it allows you to build in redundancy as well, presumably. Excellent. Well, John, I think we've definitely taken up enough of your time. I think there's some really valuable insights within that discussion. Is there anything else you feel that is important to note on the themes that we've discussed? No, thank you, Sam. It's, it's been great to chat and uh, look, look forward to joining you again for another one soon. Excellent. Thanks a lot, John, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. OK, thanks to Jeremy and Nick for taking part today. Uh, thanks, as always, to Josh Wales for producing. Thank you for listening. This podcast is sponsored by Raphael Advanced Defence Systems.